Hello, and thank you for joining this presentation, and thanks to the organizers. My name is Cristela Garcia Spitz, and I'm the curator of the Tucson Archive for Melanesian Anthropology at the University of California, San Diego. Today, I will speak about a grant to digitize the bulk of the audio recordings in the archive in the first part. And for the second part, I'll be joined by Tome Iso of the Kwena EC Cultural Center and anthropologist David Aiken to discuss the collaboration that we've had over the years and the process we took of returning the recordings to the community. Tome and David spoke in an earlier session about the Kwayo Community Archive. So working on this presentation has shaped this idea of field recordings as a part of a feedback loop that when digitized can transfer the output into the input for future interactions. This thinking is reflected in the photographs displayed here. The first photograph was taken by anthropologist Roger Kiesing in the context of his field research with the Quayo people of Malaita, Solomon Islands from 1962 to 1992. This photo in particular is from 1964 and it's of a Sango uh, skull house ritual. And the rest of the photos were taken by anthropologist David Aiken, who for many years has worked with the Quayo. His photos include the two in the middle taken in 1996, uh, another Sango performance. And the last photo is from 2017 in their computer immersion classes at the Quayo Community Archive. So these photographs reflects the types of interactions and documentation that exist and how creating and working with archival materials has become more participatory over the years. So the Council on Library and Information Resources or CLEAR Recording at Risk Grant was awarded to the UC San Diego Library in May of 2019. CLEAR is an independent nonprofit organization. The link uh, to their website is there, as well as uh, it also links to our grant proposal. The project objective was to preserve 804 reel-to-reel -reel and audio cassette field recordings from eight collections, which is roughly about 1,200 hours or equivalent to 50 days. Several of the recordings contain valuable linguistic as well as cultural knowledge access to which was previously limited to scholars that were able to physically visit the archive and could afford to have reproductions made. This project unlocks this content and makes it more broadly available to scholars and native speakers. The UC San Diego Library prioritized reformatting these recordings because of their uniqueness and importance to Melanesian studies and the cultural heritage of Pacific Island communities, as well as to safeguard against the deterioration of the physical materials and format obsolescence. The project took about a year and a half and utilized the library's existing workflows to build digital collections. It mostly consisted of logistics, inventorying, shipping items to the vendor, doing quality control on the audio files and getting them into our management system. The grant funding covered the cost of digitization, including shipping, supplies, and the work of our vendor, uh, the Media Preserve. Information about the recordings or the item level metadata was gathered from the finding aids and notes written on the box. It was then enhanced by the technical metadata provided by the vendor to adhere to digital object standards and the data requirements of the library's digital asset management system or as we affectionately call it, our dams. Images shown here, um, the veritable metadata that range from very little detail to rich detail. Sometimes we only had a number and a date range for the item. Other times there was more written on the box um, and we were able to transcribe that and add it as a description. There was an opportunity to send the audio files from the Roger Keesing sound recordings to the Solomon Islands with anthropologist David Aiken in October, 2019. He shared the files with the Quayo archive and they provided the project team with more accurate metadata. David then worked with me to improve the description, correct names and provide more context. With recordings that date back to 1963, this type of information provided during the grant is invaluable and in that the knowledge and rich detail might be lost as further time passes. So this is what I'm calling value added expertise. And it's something that I would like to explore doing with the other collections. It will require consulting with donors, scholars and communities to determine how to follow appropriate cultural protocols. And it also probably take another grant. I will certainly be following the methodology and lessons learned from the True Echoes project in hopes that they may be able to help shape a way forward. 
So in terms of access to the recordings, the UC San Diego Library has been building a virtual reading room for the past few years to facilitate access to content that may be granted upon registration and agreement to terms of use, but should not be served widely on the web. So this is what we wanted for these recordings due to the culturally sensitive and confidential information contained in ethnographic field recordings. The solution integrates two systems already in use, our local DAMS and Aon, a request and workflow management software used by the library's special collections and archives. The virtual reading room provides remote mediated access to digital objects that is time bound, requires registration, agreement to the terms of use and authentication. Access is granted for 30 days, audio files are streamed and the download feature is disabled. Development of this function required a highly collaborative effort between library staff, a regional consultant called Notch8 and the Aon developers from Atlas Systems. I'm happy to chat further about how it functions or I can put you in touch with our staff if you're interested in more technical information, but the basic process is captured here. And there were 77 of the 804 recordings in the grant that are restricted from access for privacy and confidentiality concerns, which are preserved in the dams, but only accessible to library staff through uh, login. So this provides an overview of the different collections. With the current discovery layers, um, our existing infrastructures are built on archival terms and traditions, which may not be the most intuitive way for accessing materials, especially for indigenous scholars and communities. The finding aid describes the materials in relation to the creators of the collection, and this structure is mimicked in our digital collections website. So in order to provide access that centers indigenous communities and the, dis the discovery points should be enhanced to include more details about the people, the places and the languages. I don't think we need to do away with our existing infrastructures, but I do think we need to create new layers with Pacific Island communities in mind. I'm very excited about the work of digitalpacific.org, an aggregate site that brings together digitized Pacific cultural heritage and we'll be gathering the content from the Tucson archive in the coming year or so. So it takes many hands to build and maintain these types of digital resources and they are the culmination of the work of many, um, many different people and different skill sets. So I wanna thank and acknowledge all those who contributed and now we'll move on to part two, thanks. So digitizing these recordings has facilitated content sharing and new possibilities for partnership. Moving forward, we're hoping that the digital collections can be used to engage with communities as a way of promoting storytelling and documenting current narratives. I'm joined now by David Aiken and Tome Iso, uh, who will join me in a conversation about um, the ongoing collaboration between the Cuello Archive and the Tucson Archive. So Tomek, can we start with you by um, having you share some of your reactions to the recordings? Uh, thank you, Christella. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to also share with um, this um, reaction about it. Uh, you know, at first I was a bit um, sensitive about it. I have some questions about why, why do we, you know, um, why do they get this recording? And what's the purpose of getting it? And so I, I have a lot of these questions uh, flooding in my mind. And I think because of the, the, the environment that we live and also the history and also the idea of colonization. But then when I start um, listening to it and going through the recording, I begin to realize that these um, are all wealth of knowledge and history that has been recorded in the past. And um, I began to appreciate it. And not only me, but um, a lot of people who, who have access to this recording have also seen that this is a great idea because when they see their, um, their, their grandfathers talking and see their photos, they were really, really happy because they were not able to see them in the past, especially the young generation. And so to us, it is a great privilege that we can have this recording. Uh, and, and also it, it connects us back to the past. 
And to us, this is truly a wealth of knowledge um, that has been recorded, recorded in the past for us. And so I'm really, really happy that we can, we can have access to this, to this recording now. Yeah. And how do you think the recordings can be used in the future? So um, what um, really also stood out to me about this, um, uh, this recording was the vision of the local people. Um, to me, I call them the knowledgeable people that we have in the past because of their idea and because of their vision. They see that this is really important work that they prepare for us. And I want to thank them for their wisdom and knowledge where they're able to work with um, the great people like uh, Dr. Roger Kishin and David Aiken. And so <clears throat> to me, um, this is a great resource for us, for, for choir people. Um, it will be a great benefit for all of us um, in terms of research. And now that we have um, the technology available, that we can also have access to this information available to us. And so I think this is a great foundation that um, for the choir people that we this, um, this great foundation that has been established. Uh, and it will be an idea that for us will continue. Not only that this work has been done uh, by uh, the people outside, but we want to get that idea of building on, building on top of it, because the idea is just started, but like we want choir to take ownership and, and keep keep on expanding it into the future. And so I think that's, that's the way I see it um, into the future. Thank you. And David, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about uh, what I've been calling the metadata enhancement process and your observations. Oh, David, you're muted. Do you mean uh, just working through Roger's papers and trying to uh, annotate them and identify them, those things? All the work that you were able to do to yeah. identify speakers, add in, in con additional context to yeah, the and, recordings. And, and actually, it went beyond just the, the tape recordings and into um, all sorts of things in the collection because, like so many of us, Roger, I think he thought he would work on this stuff later and he didn't record a lot of it with, and, and he didn't take notes on a lot of it with the idea that somebody else would have to figure out what was in the tapes or in the books or what the quio text was about. And uh, one of the, I, you know, I could talk about a lot of things that I learned about how archives can handle this sort of novel material better. But since we don't have much time, I thought I'd talk about what really struck me the most as a, as a researcher is while I was working through all these things, I thought this is just such a lucky coincidence that I'm here to do this for Roger's papers. Like he trained me in Quayo for a time and um, I knew almost all the people, all of the ones that were still alive and knew about the people before, knew the language, knew what's taboo and what's not, um, all sorts of things that an archivist would never know. And so it made me realize that a lot of my own field materials were not so prepared either. You know, if I should die suddenly, there wouldn't be a me to come along behind. And very few researchers have someone else who can come along behind who has the knowledge to do it and has, is willing to put in the time. You know, it, it's, it takes a lot of time to do this. And so the message of that is, is that people need to plan for far in the future while they're collecting their material. That's one aspect. So, you know, write down, if anything's confidential, write confidential, not for archiving or whatever terms you want to put on it, because nobody else is going to know. And so the archivist gets a huge collection and maybe they know there's some things in there that might cause problems if they're returned to the community, but they don't know because it's in language and all the rest of it. So it's up to you as a researcher to mark this stuff right away. The second thing it's up to you as a researcher to do is to talk to the community 
about what they want done with the things you're collecting. Um, with me, it was easy because um, I was working there at, 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 with the cultural center, as we talked about yesterday. And um, I was collecting an archive for the Quail community, but more to the point, a lot of the knowledgeable older men and women I was working with, they told me we sometimes I would they would ask me to record things that I had no idea of recording and they just come and say I want you to record this and they would say I want you to record this because the young people aren't paying attention and they don't think it's important and when we die they're going to want it but it won't be here because we'll be gone so we want you to record it so I had that advantage and that right away there were people in the community who told me what they wanted done with it but it's something you need to settle now because, and also try to set up a relationship with an institution like UCSD, the Melanesian Archive, while you're still around to do it, because it can be really hard for people in, you know, in New Guinea to set that kind of thing up. They don't know the people in the archive and you can be the middle man or middle woman and, and make that happen. So the big point is think about these things when you're still an active researcher and don't wait until you retire and think when I retire, I'm going to fix up my papers for an archive and such, because you don't know what's going to happen. Roger didn't think that he would die as young as he did. And so he didn't make any preparations. The word confidential never appears in his field notes at all or anything. And so if I hadn't been around, it would have been so much harder to archive this collection and to know what to return to Quayo and to have a com to have a connection with the quail people most people, that's not going to be the normal condition so you need to think about that now that's what that's what occurred to me most strongly when i was working on when i started working on the materials yeah and i i want to pick up on that and discuss a little bit more of the the strengths and the the challenges of having this ongoing collaboration between the quail archive and the Tucson archive i know i personally have benefited quite a bit from the long-standing uh, relationships that were built before i was in the position um, my predecessor kathy creeley worked with you, David, um, all the way back into the 90s, uh, talking about the recordings and the materials when they were first brought to the archive. And as you mentioned, you had your longstanding relationship with the Cueo community and were able to negotiate some of those conversations. Um, are there other um, sort of thoughts that you wanna contribute about, about just the, the sort of challenges to, to the archive, to that, this process and this collaboration? Tell me, right? Oh, either of you, either <laughs> of you, <laughs> we can pick up on it. Tell me, take, take it, tell me. That's a big one, that's a big question. <laughs> That's a big question. I think um, for, for us, um, I think the strength I would say um, to us is um, the opportunity that, um, that we can be able to access this, this information because um, usually the idea about the archive usually is, is about um, uh, government and like university institutions where they, they keep all this archive, but, but to us, uh, I think um, the local people should be the custodian of this information and it should be made available to them. And so for us, for your people, I think that's that's the, the strength that we, we have uh, because we were able to, to record this information, uh, especially those uh, in the past with their, with their vision. And so this is, this is a great uh, work that we, we're happy to build on. Um, however, uh, this work is, is not so easy, uh, especially for me as a young person from Kwayo. Uh, there's a lot of um, challenges um, to it. For example, the, the access, accessibility of it uh, is, is one of the challenges. Um, uh, the, other, the other challenge is a lot of the material in the archive is in English. And so, um, a lot of people like in, in the mountain, they have never gone to school. So 
reading English is a bit of challenge to them, so they can't understand most of them because it is on uh, uh, in English. So there's a bit of work that needs to be done in, in trying to translate all this um, information into into Kwai or something the language that can be easily uh, readable to um, uh, local people. And the other the other challenge I can see is um, the politics, like community politics and the church Christians. Because they see the idea of this archive is that's for like the hidden people. It's not for us. But if they they look into the content of the archive, there's a lot of information in there is about the history of church and the government. And these are the in, important um, information about it. So that, that that is a continuous challenge to us. And um, I think one of the, the challenges for us is building on this, this archive and this work, this idea is a great idea. I think we need the training of how do we do to continue with this archival work. And so this is another challenge that need to be addressed, like especially for a lot of people. How do we build on this, this, this great idea? And so the training is very, very important for us and also um, like continuous support um, for local, local expect to continue doing on this work and like a collaboration with the international partners that, that we can continue this work further. And so that's, that's some of the challenges and the strength that I see it's important to, you know, address. I think the training is also really important to allow people to fully cooperate with archivists because otherwise the knowledge is all one-sided on both sides and if, if Quayo people know what archiving is about yes. then they can better work with archivists to make it work better on both ends um, so that's it's, you know I, I'm not an archivist I'm trained as an anthropologist and I can organize things a bit but not like an archivist but so we really are keen to get some training for um, some Quayo people to be able to do that. So I was going to point out one other thing that I think is really interesting. I talked about all the, the people I worked with um, through all the years I was doing field research. And they weren't all old people. But they were a lot of knowledgeable people. A lot of them were old. And it's, it, what I find really neat is that they were keen on preserving this stuff and recording this stuff for younger people down the road. And now they were right. They were prescient, they knew, they saw into the future. And mm -hmm. now the young people who they left it to, people like Tomei are concerned about preserving it for people down the road further. Mm -hmm. So there's this continuity that I think it really gives it a strength that it wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, and I, I, I think about a lot the the possibilities that are opening up with within with new technologies and sort of this digital era that we're living in. Um, and I've been, you know, very excited to be able to have these sorts of conversations with both of you, um, even though we're all in very different locations and different time zones, um, but that we've been able to collaborate. So um, so thank you so much for, for doing this and for being a part of uh, the work that this grant enabled for us. Um, and with that, I think I'll say thank you and we'll- Thank you, Cristela, it's been yeah. great. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks.